Back in 2018, um, I was dating my wife. When I would go up there to visit her, uh, we'd go out, whatever, to breweries and live music, and this is Appalachia, so when she would come down here, I'd take her squirrel hunting, because that's, that's how you date. And uh, we were out on Parker Road, uh, which is part of the wildlife area here at Salt Fork, and got this r middle of the evening, got this really long, mournful howl. So we got out of the woods, and she asked me what that was, because I'm, I'm pretty good at most most of the noises that animals will make throughout their lifetime, like throughout their life cycle, I can identify, at least here. And I said, yeah, I, I don't, I have no idea what that was. So she was Googling animal noises, and I said, hey, look up the Ohio howl. And she looked it up, and she said, uh, Oh, that's exactly what we heard. What is that? And I said, well, allegedly it's a Bigfoot. Nestled in the heart of Ohio lies a place of beauty, mystery, and legend. Welcome to Salt Fork State Park. With its vast expanse of nature, winding coves and branching waterways, it is the epicenter of Bigfoot sightings in the state. Join us on our journey as we venture into the heart of one of the squatchiest places in the U.S., the beautiful and infamous Salt Fork State Park as we uncover the legends it holds. John Hickenbottom is Salt Fork's resident naturalist whose passion for nature is matched by his curiosity for the legend of Bigfoot. With a detailed knowledge of Ohio's wildlife, flora, and history of its natural places, he has a unique perspective on the sightings and stories of Sasquatch in the Buckeye State. If you look at the history of the land in Ohio, uh, you know, prior to European contact, 95% of the state was old growth, hardwood climax forest. And if you fast forward to the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, uh, that number had dropped down to, I mean, some estimates are as low as 8% of the state was forested. Now, uh, with conservation efforts and better land management, things like that, much more of the state has regreened. If you look at the history of the land use in Ohio, it uh, kind of coincides with the history of the Bigfoot sightings in Ohio. And I think, like most animals here, things like white-tailed deer, black bear, things like that, that if there is a creature like Bigfoot, as the wilderness recovered, uh, it moved back in to Ohio. The er earliest post-European contact story that anybody can really find uh, that directly has to do with the state of Ohio it was in 1865 uh, or 1869, Gallipolis, Ohio. There was a wild man attack in Gallipolis that was taken seriously enough for uh, like the sheriff to round up a posse to go look for the wild man. And there are stories from the surrounding areas during settle, like the settlement period of Ohio. I mean, uh, in the Draper manuscripts, which kind of outline uh, what frontier life was like based on oral histories of frontier life. Uh, there's actually a, a reference, Daniel Boone had his own Bigfoot encounter just over the Ohio-Kentucky border near a place called Mount Sterling, Kentucky. So uh, there's a history of that. and. If you think about all the animals that we've sort of pushed out of Ohio, things like mountain lion and elk, and I mean, white-tailed deer were extirpated from the state at one point. Beaver was extirpated from the state. All of those things are, are back. So there's plenty of room for something like uh, an undiscovered bipedal hominid to live. For decades, Salt Fork has been whispered about in hushed tones as a haven for the elusive Bigfoot. From the dense woods of Bigfoot Ridge to the echoing chambers of Hosack Cave and the infamous bleachers of group camp, every corner of this park holds a tale. If you look at most indigenous cultures even, caves play some significant role in religious practices and things like that. Hosack's Cave is a big rock shelter, it's a big overhang. We know based on artifacts that have been found there that at least like 2,500 to 4,000 years ago, it was at least seasonally inhabited by native people, probably a seasonal hunting inhabitant, which is as they're passing through. 
We don't really have any evidence of permanent habitation right there. I can tell you that there have been a number of sightings all around Hosek's cave. Some of them we have found were hoaxed. You know, a guy in a suit, which is a shame because that jeopardizes the integrity of all the research being done. The only footprint that I've ever been taken to, like somebody has said there's a footprint, you know, a series of footprints, it was near Hosack's cave. That's the only one that anybody's ever taken me to. But I wasn't there when it was made. All I can say is something made that footprint. So we're pretty sure that if it exists, it's a nice area, lots to eat, lots of shelter, clean water, that sort of thing. The tyrannical lake shores of Salt Fork hide tales of unexpected encounters where the stillness of the water is broken by unexplained events. Could this be the elusive Sasquatch attempting to ward off fishermen who bring their boats too close? Or could it be park visitors playing tricks on evening anglers? Two fishermen, they were fishing for catfish, started getting really large rocks chucked off the hillside and into the water in front of them. And uh, the way they described it is when they looked up to see where the rocks were coming from, they weren't zipping through the trees. They were arcing out of the woods. And they said, you know, we, we don't know anyone who could throw a melon-sized rock that hard. Their assumption was that it was not a someone, it was a something that was throwing uh, throwing rocks at them. So that's like the best lakeshore encounter that I've ever, ever heard. Bigfoot Ridge is a serene picnic and camping area by day, but by night, it transformed into a hot spot for mysterious sightings. Many Sasquatch encounters, both visual and auditory, have been noted from this infamous area in the park. The name draws in visitors, but an unexpected few get more than they bargained for. Traditionally, Bigfoot Ridge wasn't named Bigfoot Ridge, and it was just a picnic area before it was primitive camp. There was an encounter there that kind of led to the name Bigfoot Ridge. Some folks were picnicking and saw two Sasquatches come out of the woods, walk out in the open, and then back into the woods. And it was enough to, like, scare them. You know, they just walked through. It was a classic, kind of a classic Bigfoot encounter. There have been encounters kind of down over the hill from Bigfoot Ridge. I know one gentleman had digital recorders that he was just sort of placing in trees along the way just to see if he could pick up anything. And as he was walking, you could hear him like turn the recorder on, shuffle around, put it in the tree, and you can hear him walk away. And as soon as his footsteps fade, you can hear an obvious two-legged, heavy two-legged animal follow right by. And every one of his recorders picked up the same thing. You can hear it turn on, shuffle, you know, you can hear him walk away and you can hear this little, like galumphing shuffle behind him. So I think that's pretty interesting. The group camp area is where families gather and stories are shared. But some tales are whispered, tales of watchers in the woods. From the tree knocks to the eerie feeling of eyes peering out from the forest, group camp is one of the most mysterious and sought after areas of the park for those who seek the legend of Sasquatch. Group camp has been a hotbed for activity historically. Lots of weird stuff back there. That's my only tree knock that I've ever heard was in group camp. So I set up over here in the uh, kind of the northwest corner of the group camp and set up some camera traps and stuff down over the hill here behind me. But that night while I was recording and kind of just rambling to my iPad, uh, I got a tree knock right over there, right in the woods. And uh, there was nothing there that I could see and nothing that could make the noise. This was March 2021, so it wasn't like there were walnuts falling out of the trees at that point. But later on that night, I had heard some shuffling in the woods over here, and I thought, you know, whatever, deer, raccoon, something. And I thought I'd sneak up on whatever it was. And I, so I got my headlamp and started sneaking over into the woods over there kind of had my finger hovering over the button of my headlamp to spotlight whatever was shuffling around in the woods. And just as I'm starting to get close, I got another pretty identical sound right over here. So that's, what is that, 75 yards from where I was creeping around. When I turned around, whatever I was sneaking up on took off into the brush. 
So, I mean, that's kind of, again, no smoking gun, but that was my minor experience. The interesting thing is this area here to my uh, right is what some research groups consider the bleachers. They, they seem to think that these animals come in and watch people at group camp and they hang out there inside the woods. It's kind of a creepy area too at night. I always try to tell people like, there's not anything supernatural about being creeped out. We're still animals and we're not that far removed from actively getting eaten by things. So getting creeped out is not necessarily a supernatural thing. It's not a sixth sense, it's a survival mechanism. So there are areas when you're in the woods where maybe you don't have the best vantage point and you just feel off because it's not because of anything supernatural, it's because you can't see your whole perimeter and your mind is still an animal mind. And, and that area is kind of like that where there are parts of it where you're like, oh man, it's just, I'm a little creeped out here. And that area certainly has that, that kind of that bad vibe. I like it, I really like going up there. A lot of our research groups will stay at group camp and there's no shortage of encounters from that from that area. So I'm always very skeptical uh, when a group comes out and sees something every time because I'm a pretty good hunter. Like I usually fill my deer tags every year. Some years I don't. Some years I, I get completely skunked. And that's how hunting works. The same goes with Bigfoot. If you see something every time you go out, chances are good you're probably not seeing Bigfoot, you know? Um, and if you're hearing voices and you think it's Bigfoot, you should get a CAT scan. It's probably not Bigfoot. In a world of legends and mysteries, John Hickenbottom stands as a beacon of scientific curiosity, seeking answers in the shadows of Salt Fork. A healthy dose of skepticism is a great compliment to the curious mind. John, being a classically trained naturalist, entertains the idea of Bigfoot's existence, yet makes sure to take a logical and scientific approach to all the stories he hears, but doesn't dismiss any claims outright. I try to predicate everything with if they exist because I have never had that smoking gun encounter uh, where you get that sort of Pentecostal enlightenment about Bigfoot. I've never had that encounter. I'm completely open to the idea, but it's from a scientific aspect, it's good to remain skeptical. I did start taking things much more seriously when I, when I was talking to people that didn't have any reason to make it up. Because you think about the demographic of Bigfoot folks that you normally interact with. I mean, there's a lot of like dads and, you know, jean shorts and tube socks that kind of go about it all goofy, you know what I mean? But when I got a little old lady talking about going to a one room schoolhouse in West Virginia when she was a kid and there being a monkey one, one year that was peering into the windows, freaking all the kids out. And it wasn't until she was much older and an adult and she realized that it wasn't a monkey that what she was seeing was a Bigfoot. It's like, wow, why would this little, little old, you know, she's a little old lady, why would she make it up, you know? Um, it just seems kind of strange to me that, you know, those sorts of stories, the stories where they're like dedicated outdoorsmen saying, I'll never go into that woods again because it scared me so bad. I kind of take the approach like dismissing it flat out on the grounds of it doesn't fit into your uh, into your little box of what exists and what doesn't uh, is really disrespectful. If you take Bigfoot out of it and then it like and make it religious, it, you become really disrespectful if you're like, well, I can't prove your religion. Obviously, you're uh, intoxicated because you talk with angels. You become very disrespectful at that point. So I try to keep open to that and keep myself in check, like even keep my skepticism in check where I'm like, this outlandish story, I, I'm still going to listen to it. Even when it comes to like portals and things like that, the stuff that doesn't really have a biological precedence, I'll still listen to it and still be respectful because there's there's some reason why you're telling this story. Now, it might be to get attention, um, or there, you know, might be something else, and there might be some sort of, you know, biological explanation for the things you saw. Bigfoot has eclipsed mere mythology and has become a cultural icon. It has captured the imagination of generations. Its allure transcends mere tales, becoming a symbol of the unknown and the wonders of nature. For John and other lovers of the natural world, Sasquatch can help strike an interest in the outdoors for those who may not have had an initial attraction to it. 
kids will ask, is Bigfoot real? And that is a hard question. Like, is Bigfoot real? Because that really depends on what your, like, how objective your reality is. Is it real that you can go find specimen in a museum you can go examine? There's not. So if that's your definition of real, is that we have a deceased body, then no, by your hard definition, Bigfoot's not real. If you mean he's real, if you loosen up your, you know, definition of what real is, if you mean you can put a Bigfoot shirt on and drive anywhere in the country and people will 100% recognize it as Bigfoot, and someone will have a Bigfoot story or know someone that has a Bigfoot story, they'll have an uncle that had a Bigfoot encounter, or they at least, you know, oh, I saw in search of when I was a kid and I was just, you know, that sort of thing, then yes, by that definition, it is, and here, at least here in, North, I'd say even North America, including Canada, you know what I mean? It's part of our consciousness. I mean, the Mothman's not selling beef jerky, you know what I mean? So it's real by that definition, in my opinion, but it is a good touchstone for conservation because if Bigfoot exists, you have something that is so wild we can't even get a good picture of it, you know? If Bigfoot exists, it means that we haven't ruined everything yet. And it also means that they're endangered based on habitat loss and things like that. If I can get a kid involved in conservation and it's because of Bigfoot, like, that's a win. So yeah, Bigfoot is a huge touchstone for the conservation world. Like, I think that it is plausible that we haven't discovered everything yet. And it seems strange that there are stories that persist through time. The uh, Oren Pindic in, in Java and Sumatra and those places, like Homo floresiensis, that's, a, you know, the stories of this little goblin persist in the modern times. Like, it's modern folklore, too. I mean, from a conservation standpoint, like, Bigfoot is this sort of untapped resource. Like, the idea that you know, you can get out in the woods and do something other than bird watching or hunting and fishing. You, and here at Salt Fork, we embrace that. People come here specifically to spend all night in the woods looking for Bigfoot. Well, they're not at home watching the game, you know what I mean? They're out using public land, they're out learning about nature. And public land is a, it's not a right, this is a privilege that we have here in Ohio. Like, I grew up only hunting and fishing on public land. Like, I wouldn't be a naturalist if it weren't for salt work. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do the things that I do if it weren't for salt work here. So, yeah, and Bigfoot's part of that now. Salt Fork State Park, a place where legends roam, where science seeks answers, and where nature's beauty captivates the soul. On our journey, we have learned of creepy encounters, unexplained noises in the night, and in the end, how Bigfoot has impacted the hearts, minds, and souls of people all across the planet. Whether for conservation wins, scary campfire stories, or outdoors investigators, Sasquatch is out there capturing our imaginations. So, what do you believe? Wild Wishes Program and its Youth Conservation Outreach Higher Calling Wildlife have granted more than 200 wildlife encounters for children facing critical illness, life in the foster system, loss of a parent or a sibling, depression, and other challenges. If you know of a young person that might qualify for this program and would like a wildlife encounter, yes, including Bigfoot expeditions, email chester at chestermore.com that's chester at chestermore.com or message the Kingdom Zoo Wildlife Center on Facebook. 